I was talking to a group of people uh, last night and I worked out quite scarily that I began high school down in Bridgend 25 years ago. Can you believe that? Back in those days, we had slate and chisel. There was no such thing as a smart board. There wasn't even a whiteboard in my day. We still threw chalk. Um, the teacher did if you were talking, as I've got the, the scars still to prove. And one thing I remember about my time in high school was a retreat that somebody came in uh, one season to lead. I can't quite remember if it was Advent or Lent, but they came in. And during that retreat, they brought in with them a picture for us to reflect upon. In the 21st century world, our young people would have a smart board and we'd pop up on a screen. But this person brought in a real picture, you know, something big and proper uh, to look at. And what the scene was, was a winter country scene. Picture this. A winter country scene. Sort of the hills going off into the distance and the hills being covered with snow as far as the eye can see. You get that sort of image uh, in your head. And that uh, snow is undisturbed through the valleys and the vales, through the, the long fields, undisturbed snow, bar two things, two paths that have been created by people who have gone for a walk through this snow in this countryside scene. For the first walker in the picture, his method of walking through this snow was slow and steady, was to look down at his feet and take every heavy movement, one by one, one by one. I'm sure being careful not to trip over or fall, but always looking down, never looking up. And so we see the consequence of his footprints in the snow. The second person walking, perhaps a companion of his, his view, uh, his vision of uh, what he was going to do, his methodology, if you like, was a bit different. For him, he thought, right, I'm going to look at where I'm heading and I'm going to keep my eyes on that horizon point and I'm just going to go there. And so that's what he did. And so for us, we get a, a, a privileged glance at this scene, these two different sets of footprints in the snow. For the first man, because he was looking down at his feet, slow and steady, one by one, his footprints become all higgledy-piggledy. There's no direction. And so sometimes he would veer off to the left, hello left, Sometimes he would veer off to the right. And so we end up moving in a sort of a zigzag motion up the, the field to the horizon point. When we look at the second walker's footprints, what we notice, because he had his eyes fixed on a particular point in the horizon, his journey that he made was much shorter because his journey was much more direct to the point. We've got the direct of one versus the higgledy piggledy that's a word in us, of another. As Christians, we are invited then time and again to maintain the long-term vision. In other words, to keep looking at the rising of the sun, as the Eucharistic prayer will say very shortly. In other words, to keep our eyes fixed upon the ultimate goal. That ultimate goal, of course, being the kingdom of heaven, that place where we desire to be. And it, it, and it is heaven where we hope to be reunited with the, those people who we love and cherish, where we're able to be taken by the hand of Almighty God to the place where he has prepared for us, to be able to praise him with the choirs of angels for all eternity. Anything less 
than looking at that ultimate goal, looking at that long-term vision, means we become like that first walker in that picture from school. We end up looking down at our feet, never looking up. In other words, we end up moving through life, being as absorbed in the world and being absorbed by the things of the world. And as we can see, this doesn't lead us very far. The readings that we've heard over the last few weeks have offered us the tools with which we are able to begin to navigate through the terrains of life, while at the same time keeping our eyes fixed upon our ultimate goal, experiencing that beatific vision, experiencing for ourselves the kingdom of God. The life of virtue then, as we hear today, the God-given disposition we have to goodness and the living out of the life of virtue is the training ground, if you like, upon which we are strengthened in our faith. And so, as a consequence of being strengthened, we are able to face afresh the challenges of life, to face those rocky terrains and those adverse cambers which run the risk of knocking us off our course. As we listen to today's gospel, we are reminded that the virtuous life is more than skin deep. It's not merely about making good choices, being at the right place at the right time. It's about more than that. Rather, it's about allowing those opportunities to make good choices, to be in those right places, affect us, to penetrate deeply in our hearts, to begin a process of conversion, if you like, that turning back to God, that transformation in Christ. Isn't this the difference we hear between the Pharisee and the tax collector in the gospel? To be able to honestly approach the very presence of God himself as reflected in the gospel by the temple in the Jewish tradition. And in God's presence to humble ourselves, to bow our heads and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. There's a hymn which I'm sure we all know, which begins, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Let us never fail to keep searching for that kingdom, to keep our eyes fixed upon his kingdom. Let us pray that the life of virtue and grace may be something which is transformative for our lives, that may be something that penetrates deeply, so that when our time arrives and we behold the throne of Almighty God, we may hear those words of Jesus spoken directly to us. Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen.